Hello Internet, this is KJ for IPS, and today we're going to talk a little bit about dedicated servers. A dedicated server is a computer in a data center that you pay for generally monthly or annually. This computer is hooked up to a big fat internet connection and is great for hosting small projects. Generally, when you order one of these, you'll receive an email with content not unlike this. You know, this is one that I've mocked up for our example here. It simply says, Dear Mr. Han, your dedicated server is now accessible at some domain that is usually provided by them. Of course, in this case, I'm using my internal home network and the IP address, as well as a username and password to use for your initial login. Obviously, this doesn't help us a whole lot. Oh, I have a typo. No, I don't. Typo? What typo? I see no typo! No typo. So, obviously, we're using an entirely fake domain. Last time I checked, fake domain TLD doesn't exist. If it does, this is a sad universe. Now, I'm going to make the assumption that most of you are running Windows, because the likelihood is if you're running, running Linux, you don't need this tutorial at all. So, we're going to use a piece of software called Kitty in order to um, connect this. Let's get a web browser here. So the program we're looking for is spelled Kitty. It's called Kitty. It's spelled like this. Obviously, you get kitties, but first result, at least for me, is the correct result. Kitty can be downloaded. It's a simple little executable. Obviously, we see Kitty Portable or the Kitty Normal one. So we're going to get the normal one. Obviously, the author would like us to donate. We can download this from Foss Hub. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it appears that I hate ads. Well, we'll just download that in. Now, Kitty is a bit special, unlike other softwares you may be familiar with. Kitty does not require you to install it anywhere. So for now, I'm just going to use my desktop. Okay, so I'm just going to move Kitty onto my desktop. If I just launch Kitty, you'll see we have this. Now, it loaded some of my saved configurations from other servers. A few things to take a look at at Kitty, as we have the server we're connecting to. The port we're doing it on, which we're not going to touch. The way we're connecting, we're going to be using SSH. Basically, every Linux server uses SSH. Down here are some save and load presets you can have. These are, of course, for mine, and don't, have, and you won't have any. On the side, we have different settings for different methods of connection. Um, we'll probably hit on this one here specifically later, which allows you to use something called private key authentication, which is considerably safer than password authentication. So, the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to connect to our brand new server. So, we're going to, we, ha we have been given a host name here, and we're going to use that because it's easier. And for the interested person, uh, this host name will not exist outside of my home network. Honhaus.org is in fact a real domain, but none of these computers are accessible to the outside world. So, if I connect now, Kitty has produced a security alert that says, the server's host key is unknown. Basically, there's not a way, well, easily, to guarantee that a computer is who it says it is. Occasionally, you'll have this fingerprint, as shown in this dialog, in the email, but for now, we just have to trust it, unfortunately. If we say yes, Kitty, which is, of course, conveniently off-screen, which we're going to make a little bit bigger here, we can go into the appearance, and I'm going to up it to, I think, 14 point font makes it a little bigger and asking me who I want to log in as. In our email from you know our non-existent hosting company we were told to log in as root so we're gonna do that and we're just gonna copy and paste the password because it's a million times easier than trying to copy it, trying to type it and some of them may be typing. In Kitty you can right click at any time to paste. You can see I have a last login and we're gonna assume that that was from the when they were initially setting up this machine here we are at the mysterious and terrifying command prompt. We're going to go through just some initial safety things to do when we first connect. The very first thing we're going to do, it's considered dangerous to run around as root. Root is like the god of the computer. Root can read and write and edit any file, anything, anywhere, at any time. While this power is really useful for debugging purposes and other such things, it's kind of dangerous to have it running all the time. So the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a new user. This is done with the user add command. 
we're going to, you know, since my name is Aaron, I'm going to add a user whose name is Aaron. Now, now this command is returned. Nothing special happened, but what I requested happened. Therefore, I have tried to add user Aaron has been added. If I try it again, it'll tell me it already exists. So hunky dory, Aaron exists. Good for him, but he doesn't have a password. So let, we can set him a password by saying password p a s s w d Aaron, and we're gonna just set a password here. Yeah, I'm using a bad password, but this is only an example. Root is allowed to set bad passwords, though when a user tries to update their own password by just using the password command, they're generally held to higher standards. So we've got Aaron, we send an email off to Aaron, or since I'm Aaron, we can now log in as Aaron. If I real quickly make a new session, we're going to do you know, exactly the same as we did, read at honhas.org, a slightly larger font size. I oh, know we're doing 14 point. And we hit open. It'll ask us who we want to be again. Be Aaron. So Aaron isn't root, but so he can't do crazy things. So root, you know, goes into a folder. Well, let's say, well, root isn't a folder. Um, first command that you're going to learn is called cd, besides user add and password that we parent in. cd lets you move around. So everything's in folders. Everything begins at a very magical folder whose name is just a forward slash. This is the one next to shift if you're using a US or many other keyboard layouts. LS is the next command that we're going to go over. LS lists the folders in the current directory. Depending on what Linux you're using, they may or may not be color coded. These folders you see here are just some examples of what you'll typically find. All their names mean something, but we're not going to go into that. Home is a special folder. Which we, if we go into home with CD Home, LS can you see there's a folder named Aaron. And if we look in Aaron, we can see that there's nothing in there, but... Yeah. However, if I logged in as Aaron, it dumps you right in your home. I make a file. We're going to talk about the touch command real quick. Touch creates an empty file. We'll call it file.bar. And we ls Aaron again. So we get file.bar. Remember, root is God. He can look anywhere. Root's home directory is not actually in home. It's slash root. It always is. And there's a file here left over from the installation process. However, if Aaron tries to go in there, he can't. Obviously, this is bad. Now, Aaron is a system administrator. He, we like him to be able to use root power. Now, any user can switch to any other user, provided they know their password. Because, you know, Aaron does. He can actually say SU. SU will prompt for the password by default root you can specify any other username here and copy and paste the password again but this is suboptimal especially if you've got more than one user you know the who am I command anytime will tell you who you are especially if we don't want to give out that root password or we don't want to allow people to become root that simply for instance root once you're root you can become anyone I can become Aaron or I can become I don't know nobody Okay, apparently I can't become nobody because nobody is, yeah, not currently is not current is currently not available, so I can't be nobody. Oh well. Now, the other thing is, everybody knows that most Linux systems, almost all of them, have a username root, so that'll be the most common thing they'll attack. They'll assume, oh, root exists. We're going to just start trying random passwords. There's two things we want to do. We want to allow other people to become root very easily or run a single command as root or we and we want to make it so no one can log in as root from the outside so first one's very easy there's actually a command built in called sudo sudo as root obviously doesn't do anything because you're already root just like as su allows you to become a user sudo allows you to run another command as user so for instance if i'm root and i say sudo to the user Aaron, who am I? They'll say I'm Aaron. Or if I'm, for instance, the the ability, the exclusive, the elusive nobody user, it'll tell me I'm nobody. Just like you can go 
su and any username. Now, normally you can only use su if you're root or you know the password of the account you're trying to connect, you're gonna try to become. Sudo is a little special. Sudo actually comes with a file which is in Etsy. Etsy can, it only contains configuration files and it's in here somewhere called sudoers. P. However, because it very bad things can happen if you edit this file directly, sudo ships with a special program called vi sudo that allows you to safely edit this. vi sudo, I was telling you you should use it, will not allow you to save a wrong file. So we can, you know, all this is some defaults and each of these are explained, but we're not going to go into that. It also yeah, does some other stuff. Here's some examples, but the first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to make a new group. Just like you can make users, you can say group add. And this time we're going to add hyphen r. This means make this a system group, not a normal group. This is more of a formality in this case, because system groups are meant for system things, you know, access to privileges, and where normal groups are meant, you know, for like sales staff or, or groups of people. And we'll call it sudo. There, now we have an empty group named sudo, and we'll go user modify, add to group, sudo, and the user we want to modify is Aaron. This means Aaron is now a member of the sudo group. By the way, there's a command kind of like who am I called ID, which gives you a bit more information. It first lists your user ID, then your group ID, and then all the other groups you're a member of. And then this context is for something else we're not going to be getting into real quick. Obviously, if I do this Aaron, I don't appear to be in this new group yet, but that's because I just logged in. If I duplicate my session here, Note that I'm now a member of sudo. Sudo doesn't mean anything special yet. However, if we go back to our vi sudo and we go down to the very end of the file, we can add a line here. If you take example, there's an example here that says members of wheel are allowed to run all commands. This is one of their examples. So we're going to do effectively the same example, but with our group sudo. All is equal to all, all. This is a bit confusing on how this means. The first line says where you're allowed to run commands. The second line says what commands you're allowed to run. Wait, I've got this backwards. No, no, no. The first line is where you're allowed to run it. The second line is who you're allowed to run it as. And the last line is what you're allowed to run. If we save this, vi sudo will accept it and not complain. This means that as Aaron, we can now sudo things. So a quick way to test this is go sudo who am I. The first time a user uses sudo, it'll give this little blurb. It says, we trust you to receive the usual lecture. And it's basically just a, a warning. And then it will ask you for your password. Oh, I spelled the who am I command wrong. Sudo will not prompt you again for quite some time. The length is actually configurable. You can even configure sudo to not require a password. So we've got objective one. People don't need to log in as root. Now we want to keep them from doing it. Now there's a few ways to do this, but we're going to do one of the simplest. The system we've been using to connect is called SSH. And it has its own server software that was pre-installed by our service provider. And it has a configuration file. As I said earlier, configuration files are usually kept in Etsy. So if we go into Etsy, there's a folder called SSH. You know, if we look at our working directory, which is done with PWD, which is basically a where am I command, we'll say we're in Etsy SSH. And inside this folder, we see a few files. One of these is named SSH config, and one of these is named SSH D config. SSH D config is the configuration for the SSH daemon. A daemon is a piece of software that runs in the background and does something. In this case, it allows people to connect using SSH. So, if we edit this file now, I'm gonna use. I'm gonna go around the problem. We gotta edit a file. Vi sudo obviously worked for that, but we can we say editor? 
We cannot just say editor. We cannot say edit. So we need an editor. So I'm going to recommend VI for now. It's well, VIM. It's usually pre-installed, but if it's not, you can use the command and as root sudo, if you're not, yum, install VIM. Obviously, it's telling me I've already installed it. VIM is a little unusual, and it's recommended to do Vim t to run through the Vim Tutor, which is a nice little explanation of how to use the tool. You know, and it's t it's got some lessons on how to use this editor. It's a little tricky to get the hang of at first. The way you use an editor is you say the editor's name, which is Vim, and then what you want to edit: SSHD config. So here we are at the editor. Now, the default color scheme is actually kind of hard to read, so we can change the default color scheme by pressing the colon key, by actually selecting the window and then pressing the colon key, typing color scheme, and I recommend Elf Lord. It's pre-installed and it's generally easy to read with Putty's default colors. You've got some information here about what to do if you change what. So by default, in VIM, you can move around with the arrow keys, these, or the last four on the second row, which is HJKL. Notice that we aren't actually editing the file yet, we're just moving around. We've got a lot of settings. Most of these have this special hash in front of them. This means this is a comment, and it will be ignored. We have some settings for setting up server blah da 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 however you know, we have some stuff that says yes we can use passwords no we're not allowed to use different types of authentication now the one we want is called permit root login and it's around here somewhere because i'm not i don't want to spend all day looking around for it and i probably missed it i'm going to press the forward slash key which starts a search and i'm going to say root this takes me to the first time it found it. You see this permit root login? We don't want this, so the very first thing we're going to do is we're going to go into edit mode. We do this by pressing the I key. And of course it is whining at me because I made a typo. See, we get entered at the bottom and now we can type. So we're going to go down here and we're going to get rid of this hash. And we're going to say no. And we're going to save. Colon brings up the thing. Brings up the prompt, W saves, Q quits. So now we're back up. Here's the catch. He's saying just haven't been applied. I can you know, still duplicate this root session, and it works. This is not good. This is because we have to reload the server to tell it to go. On most systems, you can say service, the name of the service you want to work on, and then reload. Because this is running on CentOS, service redirected to system control, but this might not be the case on all systems. If you're running on an Arch system, you probably won't have service at all, and you'll need to use system control. Now that we've reloaded the SSH server, we can try that again. If we do duplicate session, sends the password, access denied, it tries again. It doesn't even tell them that root's not allowed to log in. It just goes for a flat access denied. So now no one can log in as root. That takes out our first easy way to attack the server. However, my name is fairly common, and I didn't pick a good password. So in theory, someone could just guess my password and guess my username, and that's bad. And we're going to talk about something they can help us prevent that and make it a little bit more careful. However, it does add a slight risk because you can always lose the keys. Next time, we're going to be talking about public-private key authentication, how it can save you time, how it can help make your system secure, and how you can really screw up with it.